1957, a group of NATO experts met in Paris to study the specifications and write the operational program for a new heavy anti-submarine aircraft. In March 1958, technical specifications and structural criteria for this future aircraft were released to industry. For the next three months, the aircraft constructors drew up their design studies. In June 1958, some 20 studies, French, German, Italian, Dutch, British, and American, were submitted to NATO. From among these 20 design studies, the experts we selected in October of that year, the French Breguet 1150. This marked the birth of the Atlantic aircraft in whose construction several nations took part. France with Breguet that was responsible for the overall management of the project and Sud Aviation. Germany with Dornier and Siebel, the Netherlands with Fokker, Belgium with the ABAP company, the United Kingdom for the engines and propellers. For the weapon system, the chief participants were France, the United States, and the United Kingdom. The aircraft is powered by two Rolls-Royce Tyne turboprop engines, each of 6,000 horsepower. An auxiliary power unit makes it completely independent. The engines are manufactured by the Tyne Industrial Consortium, comprising Hispana Suiza, MAN, and FN. The Atlantic made its first flight in October 1961, with an unladen weight of 24 metric tons and a maximum takeoff weight of 43.5 metric tons, it carries 4,620 gallons of kerosene, giving it an autonomy of 18 hours. It can fly on one engine with no operational restrictions. It is manned by a crew of 12 to 13 men who work in a pressurized cabin. In order to cut down unproductive flying time, the aircraft is designed to fly at a high speed to a given zone, which it does at 300 knots at an altitude of between 25,000 and 35,000 feet. Its standard mission is an eight-hour patrol over a zone 600 nautical miles from base with a fuel reserve of 20% on return. The maximum range is 4,300 nautical miles with 10% in hand. After this rapid presentation of the aircraft itself, we shall now have a look at its anti-submarine equipment or weapon system. The weapon system fulfills many requirements. To combat submarines efficiently, the first requirement is to be able to navigate with great accuracy without depending on external aids which might be lacking in time of war. As well as constantly knowing its exact position, the aircraft must be equipped with effective means of detecting, locating, and tracking a submerged submarine. Finally, it must have the weapons to attack it. The aircraft must also possess communication systems appropriate to its task. What are the solutions to these problems? As far as navigation is concerned, the aim is a double one. As we have seen, the aircraft must be able to reach a zone, carry out a geographically effective patrol, and return to base. This is a problem of point-to-point -point navigation. Furthermore, to detect a target which is likely to disappear quickly, the aircraft must be able to reach this position with the minimum of approach error. The problem then becomes one of relative navigation. In the first case, that of point-to-point -point navigation, the aircraft can use short-range and long-range ground information by means of standard radio navigational aids. Takan, Vor, Radio Compass, Loran. The estimated position of the aircraft is given by a Type 61 Crouset navigational computer, which constantly resolves the triangle of velocities. Two Kierfahrt gyro platforms supply a gyro heading, which is transformed into a true heading by a heading computer. 
The chew heading can be reset by means of the sextant. The Doppler gives the ground speed and drift. A corrected anemometer supplies the chew air speed. Using these factors, the navigational computer automatically gives the position which is displayed on aircraft latitude and longitude counters. If the Doppler is not used, the wind data can be entered manually and the entire system operates in exactly the same way. The navigator can also set the coordinates of two targets, one of which is stored in the memory. The computer supplies the azimuth and the distance from the target to the pilot indicators. This system operates at all latitudes, including the poles, but in the latter case, a grid heading is used. The navigational computer feeds the northings and eastings to two plotting tables. Each of these tables has a large area, nearly nine square feet, and one is used for absolute navigation in area search, while the other one is used for relative navigation in the tracking and attack phase. The novelty of this system is that it gives a visual presentation of navigational and operational data supplied by the airborne equipment. The search table has two scales, one to 500,000, and one to one million, which in our latitudes represents a square with sides 220 nautical miles or 440 nautical miles long, respectively. A Mercator grid is projected and can be moved latitudinally. The search table on which the search zone is traced also shows the following. A luminous silhouette representing the aircraft position and heading the course flown by the aircraft, a circular marker controlled by the radar operator showing the target located, an orientable red vector indicating the origin and direction of a transmission detected by the ECM operator, and cruciform blips which can be entered manually or automatically whenever a marker or a buoy is dropped. When a target has been detected, the tactical table is used for relative navigation around a datum. This table comprises two scales, one to 120,000 and one to 30,000, representing zones with sides 52 to 13 nautical miles long. The table is the tactical center of the aircraft and shows the same operational data as the search table as well as blue and yellow vectors controlled by the forward and rear observers, the tactical table navigator, or the directional buoy operator. The marker pattern to be laid on reaching the target is represented by what is known as the third circle, and this is controlled from the tactical table. Two other circles show the position lines of the Julie buoys. The probable target zone can be represented by the third circle with its center on the Julie fix. This circle expands as time elapses if the estimated speed of the submarine is entered. All these vectors and circles can be moved by the navigator. A great advantage of this table is that the aircraft position is stored in the memory even if it flies out of the zone represented. When the aircraft re-enters the limits of the table, the course flown is faithfully reproduced. Any alteration in the point of origin is recorded by the position counters. Each pilot has an IDI-6 indicator showing as an azimuth and a distance either the target displayed on the navigational computer or the radar marker or the center of the tactical table. The IDI-6 can be coupled to the automatic pilot and this greatly facilitates flying. Altitude can be maintained to within five feet at any speed. The heading can be maintained to within one degree. Radio navigation can be programmed and a heading flown from the tactical table. Thus the aircraft arrives over the assigned point, wind drift being automatically integrated.
The Atlantic has now reached its zone and can explore it effectively. What detection facilities does it possess? A submarine betrays its presence in various ways. These may affect our senses or be picked up by various equipment which can assist them. One effective means is still visual observation. This can be helped by means of binoculars and still more so by radar. The sounds made by a submarine can be detected by passive listening when they are within the range of audible frequencies. Very low frequencies can be picked up by the Jezebel system. Electromagnetic indiscretions are detected by passive countermeasure equipment or we can listen to the echo caused by the bursting of a charge, the Julie method, or to the sonar from an active buoy. The autolycus can detect engine exhaust gases. Finally, changes in the Earth's magnetic field caused by the submarine can be detected by the MAD. What are the features of these equipments? The observers use wide-angle binoculars and it will be remembered that the direction in which they are aimed is represented by a vector on the tactical table. The CSF Draw 2B radar is an improved version of the Alize radar but has the same main characteristics. The operator has two expandable scales, 12 to 60 and 40 to 200 nautical miles with two pulse lengths, 0.5 and 2 microseconds, and two antenna patterns, pencil beam or square cosecant. The antenna rotation speed is either 6 or 12 revolutions per minute, with a sector scanning capability every 30 degrees. It also has special STC, FTC, IACG, and anti-jamming circuits. The antenna stabilization by means of two Kierfaut gyro platforms is excellent and enables a stable image to be maintained with 40 degrees roll and 50 degrees pitch. A 23 position monitoring scope enables the voltages and waveforms for the various circuits to be monitored during flight. The operator can freeze the screen and, as we have seen, point out the interesting echo on the table by means of a marker. Conversely, the table operator can control this marker to draw the radar operator's attention to an interesting point on the scope. The radar operator also has controls for slew, open center, and an enlargement of the area surrounding the marker. He can also identify the targets by means of the IFF APX-7 interrogator. As well as visual traces, the submarine emits noises which may or may not be perceptible to our ear. They are very low frequency noises which are processed by the AQA-5 Jezebel. This is an all-electronic system with a recorder which enables nine LOFAR boys or four CODAR boys to be marked on four charts. The submarine may also betray its presence by electromagnetic indiscretions which are picked up by the countermeasure circuit consisting of an ARAR 10B and an ARAX 10B frequency meter. The ARAR enables radars working in the S, C, and X bands to be intercepted with a very high probability of detection and analysis of transmitter characteristics, radio direction finding, pulse width, repetition frequency, and beam width rotation speed. The ARAX enables the transmission frequency to be measured very accurately. 
The ARAR and the ARAX can be coupled. The transmission intercepted by the ARAX, which is more sensitive, can be frequency selected and passed to the ARAR for analysis. Conversely, a transmission intercepted by the ARAR can be isolated on the ARAX so that the frequency can be measured. A short transmission with a single antenna rotation enables the direction of the transmitter to be ascertained with an accuracy of three degrees or one degree with several antenna rotations. The operating reliability and the performance of this equipment have given the ECM operator a much more important role. It will be remembered that by means of a red vector, he can indicate the origin and azimuth of the transmission detected. An invisible component of exhaust gases is SO4, and its content can be measured by the Mark III-B autolycus of British origin. An air intake in the nose of the aircraft takes a sample of air, which is then ionized and accelerated in an ionization chamber. The SO4 particles are collected by a grid, and the current obtained is amplified and recorded on a tape. The range varies, favorable conditions being a strong, steady wind. All of these systems, radar, countermeasures, Jezebel, and Autolycus, allow initial detection of the submarine. However, if the submarine dives, we use other equipment to locate it, Julie and active buoys. The Julie echoes are shown on the ASA-20. It will be remembered that they are represented on the tactical table by two circles. Information can thus be supplied at a rapid rate. Another localization technique is active buoys, which are carried in the weapons bay. Their signals are processed by the AQA-1. The mean range is around 3,000 yards. Finally, to track the submarine, the nuclear MAD CSF DHAX-1, based on the measurements of the resonant frequency of cesium in a magnetic field, is used. It has an operational range superior to 1,000 feet. It is highly sensitive. Background noise does not exceed 5 one hundredths of a gamma. A special box coupled to the automatic pilot makes it possible for this aircraft to be maneuvered so as to compensate the MAD. When the submarine has been detected, located, and tracked by means of these equipments, it must be attacked. The Atlantic has a spacious weapons bay, nearly 32 by 8 feet. Three racks sliding on rails can each take five depth charges. The two forward racks can carry four L-4 torpedoes, or as shown here, eight Mark 44 torpedoes. An atomic grenade can be mounted on the central rack. Rack 3 is generally used to carry 10 active buoys. Four AS-12 missiles are mounted under the wings, as well as a photopod. In addition to the main bay for weapons, the Atlantic has special bays for pyrotechnics, markers, smoke bombs, 96 USS charges, and the 72 A buoys. It also has a retro launcher. The launching of all of these charges can be remotely controlled from the tactical compartment. <laughs> Lastly, communications. The Atlantic has two BLU transmitter receivers and VHF UHF sets. All weapon system data is recorded on a 15-track tape recorder. Such are the aircraft and its equipment. They represent a considerable step towards greater effectiveness. In spite of the very high degree of automation, 
the operators still have an essential part to play. In the hands of a well-trained crew whose reactions are thoroughly coordinated, the Atlantic is a first-rate anti-submarine weapon. 